On this edition of Great Lakes Now, how are Great Lakes businesses affected by the COVID-19 crisis? We could fish, but if we follow the safety measures for COVID-19, we can't process what we normally process. Gathering data on coastal wetlands under pandemic restrictions and how Great Lakes aquariums are connecting with the public despite stay-at-home orders. Who doesn't love to see a penguin and beluga say hello to each other? This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome to Great Lakes Now. Of course, the biggest news of the last month has been the COVID-19 pandemic. It's changed the way all of us have lived our lives, and that includes the people and organizations we've covered on this show. We've checked in with some of them to find out how they're adapting to our new normal. We introduced you to Illinois International Port District Executive Director Clayton Harris III in April of 2019. We're the greatest multimodal facility in North America. Trains, trucks, freighters, and barges all bring cargo into and out of the port. But in a pandemic, all that coming and going could spread infection. That's something the port is taking steps to prevent. Everybody who comes onto the facility, and I have a couple of them here, um, must wear uh, a face mask. Uh, you have to, and, and it's, just, it's just how it is. Now I'm sitting in my office and I'm the only one here, uh, so I don't have it on. But barge and ship, they cannot get off their vessels if they do not have the proper safety protocols. Same with train operators who won't allow the train in if the engineer, the conductors and the engineers do not have face masks on. And then every single trucker that comes onto our facility has to have a face mask. We don't want to be the, the, the cause of a spread elsewhere. So we have cargo that goes all around the world. I want to make sure that we are ready to support when the economy opens back up and they expect us to you know, move forward and that we're still doing it in a way that's respectful to human life. And that sounds crazy, but that's, that's truly it, right? So I don't expect us to drop our protocols anytime soon. Even after things open up, I just think it's wise that we just keep you know, like the face mask on for you know, a couple months beyond what's going on. We want to make sure that we're doing everything possible to keep people healthy and safe. Jason Hron is the Director of Communications and Marketing at the Duluth Seaway Port Authority, where early this year there was minimal ice cover, allowing the shipping season to get off to a good start at the Port of Duluth Superior. Iron ore was moving well, there was a bit of coal moving, and grain was moving especially well to start the season. And grain has continued to move especially well throughout the course of March and April as we do our part to feed not only North America, but the world. As the pandemic and stay-at-home orders took hold though, iron ore and coal declined. Speaking to iron ore and coal specifically, through April we saw the utilization rate for blast furnaces dropping from you know, the range of 87.5% to 57.5%. So that is an indicator that demand for steel is falling and there's certainly a domino effect from that here in northeastern Minnesota, which means that fewer ships are on the lakes carrying iron ore because there's less demand for iron ore, which means that iron ore mills are gonna shut down. So we've to this point had three iron ore mines in northeastern Minnesota that have idled and our coal dock here in the port of Duluth Superior has also idled due to the diminished demand for iron ore and coal downbound in the lower lakes. We have a saying, you know, Great Lakes Shipping, it puts the pasta on your plate and the phone in your pocket and the car in your garage. It's a part of everything in your everyday life. When people aren't using any of those things in their everyday life in the way they normally are, it changes it. Those are the challenges we're facing and when bad things happen, Throughout the Great Lakes, 
we feel the effects of them here in the Port of Duluth Superior as well. We're all connected. We introduced you to Lake and Williams and her family's business, Bayport Fish Company, in November of 2019. The pandemic has pretty much shut them down, but not because they can't catch fish. We could fish, that's nothing. We're all healthy. Um, we've got practices in place for you know safety regarding COVID-19. But if we follow the safety measures for COVID-19, we can't process what we normally process. And we sell everything we process, so that's a huge issue. Normally, most of Bayport's catch would be processed by outside companies, but they're either closed or barely running. And that leaves Lakin's workers to process any fish they catch by hand. We can do about 2,000 pounds max in about a 24-hour setting. So if that net had 5,000 pounds, um, it would be about 3,000 pounds sitting in here with no way to process. The issue is that processing fish puts people close together. Usually we're all piled around this fillet table, 10 of us at this little eight foot table. You know, um, it's efficient, it's speedy that way. You can hand the fish down to the next person who has to process it. And now with COVID, we can't do that. So we're thinking about possibly only 30% of our workforce and putting people one table, one person a table kind of a deal. Another issue? Half of Bayport's fish gets served in restaurants, but they're closed down or only serving curbside, so demand has taken a big hit. For the future, we're trying to come up with a plan to only set one net in an area we think will get right around what we need. We can set 10 nets, that's the sad point. But do I think I can sell 6,000 pounds of fish right now? Absolutely not. Dave Lawrence is the Vice President of Travel Michigan and the chair of Great Lakes USA, which markets the Great Lakes states to overseas travelers. He foresees Great Lakes residents vacationing within the region this summer. I'm actually quite positive that the leisure sector for travel in our area is going to rebound relatively quickly. I think it's going to be deliberate. In other words, people are going to be looking for places that suit their needs because of all these concerns about COVID. People are going to be looking for open spaces, small towns, lesser known places, places that aren't as uh, busy. It's going to take a while to get people to travel back to the big cities. But areas like our states are going to really be able to retain a lot of our in-state travelers who aren't going to be taking that bucket list flight to Europe this year. They're just not going to. They're going to put that off. And that's okay with us because we want to keep as many people here as we can. Most of their travel is going to be driving. And I think that our region offers this, this pretty unique opportunity to see a lot within a relatively contained area. Now, when it comes to those business travelers, that's going to be different because uh, businesses are going to have to really scale back on, you know, the number of conferences and conventions they're going to be able to allow their staff to, to go to for education and networking. It's going to take some time, I think uh, probably a year for the conferences and conventions and such to start coming back. Everybody's going to kind of delay all those. But eventually, there's nothing like face-to-face -face communication. And what about the growing Great Lakes cruise industry? In August of 2019, we introduced you to Stephen Burnett, Executive Director of the Great Lakes Cruising Coalition and Cruise Ontario. He still sees a bright future for the Great Lakes cruise industry. Some 2020 cruises have been canceled, but operators are still holding out hope. The cruise lines are canceling progressively at the moment. They're not wiping out the whole season. They're very sensibly approaching their season in a very measured way and canceling the spring, of course, and the early part of the summer. It's really anyone's guess at the moment whether they can salvage the season. When the CDC in the US and Health Canada took a look at the cruise industry, they did recognize that small ship cruising was a different challenge to large ship ocean cruising, for example. When I asked why, um, I was told that that is based on the ability of health departments to handle an outbreak. And obviously handling an outbreak is more challenging on a huge 5,000 passenger ocean ship than it is 
on a small ship in the Great Lakes. But at the end of the day, this is not an economic decision. It will be a decision taken by our health authorities. In 2019, partner station WCMU in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, released their documentary, Linking Land and Lakes, about Great Lakes coastal wetlands and an ongoing collaborative effort to understand and protect them. This summer, researchers will try to gather more data for the project, despite the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, so how many people are brand new to the crew? So a substantial number, so... Dr. Don Uzarski is the director of Central Michigan University's Institute for Great Lakes Research. Each summer, he deploys an army of researchers to collect data for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative's Coastal Wetlands Monitoring Program. We're on the Quantica Sea. We're doing a training session. We do this annually. We have Notre Dame, Grand Valley State University, of course, Central Michigan University, and Lake State are the Michigan crew. Every year since 2011, scientists and students from 15 universities and governmental agencies in the U.S. and Canada have fanned out across the Great Lakes, aiming to assess the health of the region's coastal wetlands. We're sampling 10,000 miles of shoreline every year. The Great Lakes shoreline is 10,000 miles. That's, that's more shoreline than the west and east coast of the United States. Coastal wetlands are a vital part of the Great Lakes ecosystem. They provide habitat, prevent erosion, and act as natural filters. The coastal wetlands are serving as a filter of toxicants and pollutants, the last line of defense before pollutants are coming off the landscape and getting into that body of water. If that wetland doesn't do its job, if that wetland's not there, the pollutants are gonna go directly in. Then they're gonna get into the fish and then we're gonna consume the fish. So then you have health issues. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on uh, that these ecosystems are really providing, uh, func they're functioning for us that we don't have to pay for. But if we had to clean the water, that's very expensive. If we look at a satellite image of the Great Lakes Basin, you can't even see a coastal wetland. It would just be a, a tiny little line along the shoreline that you wouldn't even be able to see yet they have huge importance to the ecosystem as a whole. Students and researchers count invertebrates, amphibians, birds, and more to get a measure of a wetland's ecological health. You can tell by what critters are living here, uh, what nutrients might be around, uh, what sort of other food network things are going on. They can indicate chemicals, differences, different biodiversity. Fish are really cool because they can tell you a lot about the water and the surrounding land use. Um, so what fish are here and in what kind of proportions can tell us a lot about the state of the wetland and the condition of the wetland in general. This holistic approach to wetland ecology is a recent development. That's relatively young science to look at the entire ecosystem. Wetland ecology was, it was kind of understudied because Limnologists study the open water of the Great Lakes or the open water of lakes, and then terrestrial ecologists study the upland. So the wetland was always too wet for the terrestrial ecologists to study and too dry for the limnologists to study, so it was kind of left unstudied. The coastal wetlands face a variety of pressures, from invasive species like Phragmites to degradation from man-made development. On the St. Mary's River, which flows from Superior to Huron, one threat is freighter traffic. The freighters impact our wetlands immensely just in the amount of waves they put off. Anthropogenic disturbances can cause our sites to fluctuate in water levels by up to half a meter in just 10, 15 minutes. And that impacts what invertebrates and fish can even exist in a system that sees so much change. From just what we've observed working this summer, we've noticed the diversity appears to be lower in sites close to the freighter shipping channel, and there just seems to be less individuals in general. The combined threats are so great that some think the health of the Great Lakes is fading. If I were to rank them on a scale from one to 10, I would currently put them at a seven and declining. We have some of the most relaxed environmental laws that we've had in decades in the Great Lakes. We have some of the highest levels of pollution in certain Great Lakes, like Lake Erie, that we've had in decades. We are quickly going back to a state that we were in the 1960s and 70s, 
where, you know, I honestly wouldn't be shocked if someday we did start to see massive fish die-offs. Climate change is another cause for concern, and it seems poised to intensify problems the lakes are already facing. What we're going to see as a result of climate change is that these harmful algal blooms that we've been wrestling with are going to get worse in places like Lake Superior that have always had some of the cleanest, most beautiful water quality that, that we've had in the world. But with the warming of the lake, Lake Superior is one of the fastest warming lakes in the world, we're beginning to see harmful algal blooms form. So if we are not careful and we don't start to manage them better, we're going to actually have some pretty severe problems with the Great Lakes in the very near future. In 2020, there's a new threat, not to the lakes, but to the research process itself. In the past, students and scientists have worked in close proximity, gathering data in the field, riding in boats and cars, and staying overnight away from home. But Don Uzarski says that with the arrival of the coronavirus, those ways of working will have to change. This time of year, we're going out for bird, sampling birds and frogs specifically, and we're going out three times to each site. We can get away with pretty small crews doing that, so it's not uh, terribly difficult. But once we start sampling our chemistry, our fish, our invertebrates, our plants, we need to put much, many more people in the field. And then we're using boats as well, so that becomes extremely complicated. At this point, it's really not impacting us because we don't have to start putting the boats in yet. Once July moves around, or even late June, that's when we're, we're going to have to wait and see. The pandemic makes data collection much more difficult and expensive. And this year's data could be especially important because with current record-setting water levels, wetland conditions are unprecedented. And we're seeing really unique conditions at this point, and these data are critical. State, provincial, federal governments are depending on these long-term data, we've never seen anything like, like this, and the conditions that we're experiencing now have never taken place, and we're never gonna be able to recreate those, and we're losing, you know, losing these data. Um, it, it's, it's, it's tough to deal with. We're at this situation where we're almost to last July's water levels at this point. Uh, we're gonna reach peaks in late July, we're already seeing things with respect to these wetlands we've never seen before, never documented before, and we're losing that. To see WCMU's full documentary on the Great Lakes Coastal Wetlands Monitoring Program, visit greatlakesnow.org. And for educational resources, including a virtual field trip to coastal wetlands, visit greatlakesnow.org education. What do you do when a pandemic strikes but thousands of aquatic creatures are depending on you? We called some Great Lakes aquarists to find out. When most public institutions close their doors due to social distancing efforts, the buoyant residents of our region's aquarium still required attention. Caretakers of these animate museums began to do what we all did. They looked for supplies. Jennifer Carter is the aquarist at the Aquatarium at Tall Ships Landing in Brockville, Ontario. The first thing that crossed our mind was really to uh, stock up on some food items for our animals because we weren't at that sure at that time it, it was really unsure what was going to happen there really wasn't a whole lot of information so that's the one thing that um, could really be unknown are we still going to be able to get food for our animals caretakers would need to also adapt animal training to the new safety procedures it's given us an opportunity to try different things such as uh, Justin, uh, so he's our uh, beaver. And we have kind of changed our method of training. We do target training with him in his habitat. And because we have to wear a mask, we can't necessarily use a whistle because um, it, it just doesn't fit under the mask properly. Um, so we've had to, you know, use our mouths and tooting and making different noises and making that adjustment to continue training with him. Over 32,000 animals, from belugas and sharks to stingrays and giant octopi, inhabit Chicago's Shed Aquarium. Despite stay-at-home orders, the Shed still wanted to provide the public with wildlife encounters through social media. We really kind of handed over the keys to the folks that were gonna be there every day taking care of the animals and said, when you can, if you could snap a photo or a video of what you're up to, 
We really wanna try and provide these real time videos and insights so we can give a window for people to still see the animals that they love so much um, and understand that they're still being really well cared for even though the aquarium is closed. But while we could check out the animals on the internet, they began missing us. We have um, a rescued wood duck named Stella. So she was non-releasable. So her forever home is here at Shed and she loves the public. She interacts at the window with the public. Really, the, the public is there in part so the animals can observe them. If you think of a fish on a coral reef, their day is gonna be just a little different each day. And the public was one aspect that provided that, um, that variety to their day. So now we'll just provide that variety in, in other ways through enrichment. In the absence of an adoring public, the shed's more inquisitive characters decided it was time to venture out. So a lot of our penguins love to find different things, to be curious. And so now is just an opportunity to take them to different parts of the building that usually just are a little too crowded uh, for penguins to do what they want to do um, while we wait for their fan club to return. And their first big field trip became a runaway success. Who doesn't love to see a penguin and beluga say hello to each other? They speak two different languages and neither one um, I am very fluent in. But um, I, I think it was pretty safe to say that both of them um, were happy with each other. <laughs> one of the really cool things that we've seen out of this kind of penguin craze is um, the penguins are almost uh, ambassadors for some of the other animals at the aquarium. And so when Wellington went to go see our Sturgeon Touch exhibit, um, it was a really great way for us to bridge and start talking about Lake Sturgeon and how important they are to the Great Lakes and how they're a prehistoric species. And um, it's really great to kind of leverage the excitement and the interest we're seeing online and kind of help people move beyond just like one group of animals and start talking about some other animals that maybe don't get as much of a spotlight normally. In Detroit, Michigan, another aquarium wanted to try a more experimental direction. Could a featherless, furless, wingless invertebrate headline as the main act? People on average may not necessarily feel connected to Madagascar hissing cockroaches. However, um, presenting them in a more whimsical, lighthearted manner might, you know, maybe create some connection. Seeing them go around the tanks just as you might do if you were at the aquarium. The Belle Isle Aquarium is the oldest in the nation. Designed by the lauded architect Albert Kahn, the historic interior features opalescent tiles that make you feel encapsulated underwater. Drawn to the awe-inspiring space, visitors can sometimes overlook less traditional members of the menagerie. Aquarius saw the shutdown as an opportunity to introduce patrons to a bug's life. I find that when people are at home um, wanting to experience the outside, that they are willing to maybe watch videos or an interest in learning about things maybe they wouldn't typically learn about. Um, so I think that the cockroaches may have drawn people in that way. Um, but I really think that uh, once you get to know one of these cockroaches, they're not as gross and scary as a lot of people think. Whether a precocious penguin or a coquettish cockroach catches your fancy, these videos are helping promote a much needed sense of unity for public institutions. We had a, an interesting partnership with the Lyric Opera of Chicago, um, where they provided some uh, original scores uh, that we paired with one of our penguin videos, which was truly epic and so interesting and something we've never done before. And so we were able to lift Lyric Opera with some of this content as well. And so it just feels really good. As we spend our days in our own fishbowl, the aquarists believe there's real value in even virtual engagement. I hope that um, people at home watching our videos will be drawn to come visit Shed in person or at least get outside. Um, maybe they'll even just look at their pets in a different light. Through those videos, um, 
we can connect people to nature, um, that's, that's the goal. That's what it's all about. But if you especially miss seeing our aquatic friends up close, the longevity of the nation's oldest aquarium is a reminder they're not going anywhere. I think that this is definitely, like with everyone, a transitional period, but also a great opportunity for growth. Um, the aquarium has withstood pandemics for over 100 years now, and I don't think this one will be much different. Thanks for watching. For more on how Great Lakes industries and institutions are adapting to the COVID-19 crisis, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you.